Today, I'm going to teach a message that I simply titled Justice. And I want to pray before I do. Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, I thank you for being with us. You said if we acknowledge in all our ways, you'd lead and direct our paths and crown our efforts with success. So I thank you for being with us. I thank you for teaching us. Father, I realized a long time ago, it's not so uh, important what I say that counts. It's what you say to each individual in this room that counts. May we hear your voice and may you speak to us. Thank you, Father, for helping me with clarity and simplicity. Teach your word. And I give you all the praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. This weekend, I started a series titled Trends Come and Go, or Trends versus Truth, actually. And we talked a little bit about how trends come and go, but God's word will last forever. Today, I'm going to teach a message on the justice of God, what that means, compared to what social justice is saying. And I'm asking you to open up your hearts and minds because so many of us have bought into the propaganda that somehow that's a good thing. Churches are preaching it's a good thing. I've heard pastors preach it's a good thing. And, and what's sad is they have no idea what they're saying. And I've, I've been listening to this. I went to a conference last year in 2020 and it was called Patriot Pastors where they were trying to encourage pastors to open up their doors and have church and reach people and touch lives and Heal the broken. And I got to speak at it, but I got to hear some great speakers, and it was just amazing to me what we believe without even knowing why we believe it. Trends come and go, but God's word lasts forever. 1 Peter 1.25, as the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Ever. We're all Sandlot fans. Come on. <laughs> and that word is the good news that was preached to you. Isaiah 48, the grass withers, the flowers fades, but the word of our God will stand. Now we're getting it. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. We really need to pay attention to the Word of God, period. We really do, because if we don't, we will be deceived. Let me read from the Scriptures, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 14. If you have a physical Bible, open up to it. You can read it, follow along on the screen or on your phone, however you're doing it. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church. So that's my responsibility is to equip the people of God and build up the church. The church is not equipped properly unless the people are involved. See, the church believes a lot of times it's the pastor's job to do everything. But if you notice, even we have prayer time here, I'm never up here because these people are great prayer warriors. They, they believe God. They know how to believe God. That's equipping the church. And so he goes on to say, the body of Christ. And this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. If we are not learning the Word of God, not what someone said, not what I feel, not what I've experienced, but the Word of God, you will be deceived and will be tossed around by every teaching. You know, so oftentimes people use this scripture to only talk about the teaching in the church. But there's a whole lot more teaching going on out there in the world than there is in the church. It's talking about any wind of teaching, the lies that try to deceive us. So here's the truth. The truth is never afraid of a lie. But a lie cannot survive in the presence of truth. 
And if a lie is to survive, truth must be, here's the word, censored. And this is why they, the world, the social media giants, are suppressing freedom of speech. Propaganda is what they put forward after they censor the truth. Propaganda is a biased or misleading info or information to promote a particular point of view. And what we have been inundated with in the last year and a half is a whole lot of propaganda. Name one other thing in the history of television in America where we've kept a ticker of deaths. Why aren't we keeping a ticker every year with the flu? Oh, the flu is no longer here. When you censor truth, all you get is propaganda. That's why YouTube kicked us off there for a week, threatened to do it again. That's why so many people can't get on there, because it doesn't meet their narrative of the propaganda they're spewing. And that's why, and it's what I said a couple weeks ago, who said we should be afraid? Well, you're not having any common sense. You're not listening. You're right, I'm not listening any longer. Because God never said you don't have the spirit of fear unless they push a virus on the world and say, you got to be afraid of this. Every article I read was they should be afraid, you should be afraid, you should fear. God never told us to fear. So the question is, why do we, why do we ever fear? Well, I'm afraid for this and I'm afraid for that. I know, isn't it something? God didn't give an exemption. I mean, we act like God's stupid people do that believe in God, like God's ignorant. I mean, I, I think about it. So what did they think, that God was sitting on his throne and said, hey, Jesus, we missed that one. We didn't see that coming. We should have told him to be a little afraid of that. And then they use things to shame you, like, you know, people have died of this. People have been dying from the flu and heart attacks and heart disease and lung disease and cancer for ever. But we're not so afraid of cancer that we start eating better. <laughs> Think about it. I, I'm not. Folks, I like my cookies. I'm on a new trend. Anybody remember Hostess Ding Dongs? Yeah, that's my thing now. I'm like, man, they're so good. But they don't come in the cellophane wrap anymore. They, they, they come in a bag, you know, you got to break it open and stuff, but. Think about it. Yeah, but this is worse. Really? Then what? Propaganda. See, God is a God of life. And that is why in the Declaration of Independence, it gives us three examples of the inalienable rights which have been given to all human beings by their creator and which governments are created to protect, especially this one. And they are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Here's what I know. You cannot experience liberty or pursue happiness if you don't have life. If you are not alive, you can't experience those things. And we need to, we need to remember that as I go on this message that you cannot experience liberty and the pursuit of happiness unless you're alive. The greatest holocaust in all of America and the world is the innocent murder of babies. They don't have life. We took their life because somehow we have the right to do that. It's a dangerous place to be. The, our government didn't give us those rights. God gave us those rights. So here it is, God's justice if, is giving man what is due him or her. If all men are created equal, then we are equal in the eyes of God and according to the law, right? Justice is both giving and receiving that which is just. And what that means, it, it is a deserved reward or punishment that's just. 
But what standards do we know what is right or fair? What is due or owed to each one of us? Some may answer the law. The law determines what is just. But not all man-made laws are just. Not even close. In the United States, it is the law of the land, again, that unborn children can be killed, murdered at the whim of their mothers. Is that just? No. There's so many laws that man makes that aren't just at all. God alone determines what is right and what is wrong, what is just or unjust. God's justice is treating others in all areas of life in such a way as to uphold God's revealed standards of good and evil. In other words, giving them what they are due. Psalms 89, 14 says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. What is the foundation of God's throne? You can't have one without the other. You can't have righteousness without justice. Unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. Righteousness and truth. Acts 10, 34 said, then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism or some no respect of persons. Why is that? Because he's just. He doesn't care how rich you are or how poor you are. You get what you, what's due you. Good or bad. That's just. That's God's justice. That's biblical justice. God's justice gives people what they deserve. Good or bad. Now, social justice equates rights based upon to what group you belong, if you're the homosexual group. And by the way, can I say this? There are chat rooms now. Can I, let me just say, let me back up. The homosexual community cannot reproduce anything. So they have to recruit your kids. And there is an all-out assault that they're openly saying now to recruit, recruit our kids while the church remains silent and says, we don't want to offend anybody. And there are things you need to check on your children to see what they're looking at. And what they're in, what they're reading. Because they're all out recruiting your kids. And, and that's a group. And social justice says that they, they equate rights based upon what group you belong to, homosexual, the vaccinated now, race. Safety. Remember when this all first started, we're going to keep you safe. That, that, that person up there couldn't keep anybody safe. And you know what? Didn't. But that was it. So now it was the ones who believe we're keeping them safe and the ones who don't. You guys, and this is what she said about us, we're, you're super spreaders. You're not listening to me, so you're wrong and evil, and you don't care about your neighbor. And here's a lady who murders babies and brags about it and tells people like us who have spent their life caring for people that we don't care. You know what the difference is? We care about eternity. We care about whether people go to heaven or hell. And over 2,500 people in that year made heaven their home, and they would not have if we'd have closed our doors. Was that worth it? To me, it was. To me, if it was just one, it would have been worth it. But that's how they separate. So you understand, they equate rights based on what group you belong to. The critical race theory uses other means to divide people, and I'm, I'm going to get into a little bit of that, and then I'll do a teaching on that. Marx, or Marxism, Karl Marx, when he created what we know as communism, he used property owners versus non-property owners because in social justice to thrive, there has to always be a conflict. We have to pit these people against these people, and Americans are so what we're, misinformed, because I want to say something, that we get in the fight that they created. Who? The government, the world. 
So he created property owners versus non-property owners. Folks, that's when Stalin took over and made communism what it was and killed millions and millions of people and Jews. We, we, we don't even know our history. That's why we're repeating it. That's why we're willing to give up our freedoms and rights. And then people mock, hey, you say it's your right. Yes, it is my right. And then they shame us to say it. It is my freedom. Not because you gave it to me, because God gave it to me. Why do you think, why do you think the big issue was to close the churches? Because once you believe what I'm talking about, they can't control you. And what is the whole goal to control? I'm so happy when I walk around Albuquerque now, and how many people are not listening to the governor? I'm like, woo! Yeah. <clears throat> Today, the same thing uses sex, color, sexual preference, identity. See, it looks for areas of division and creates conflict. And out of conflict, you create revolution, which is the goal. That's what we saw all summer pitting people against each other. So one white guy kills a black guy. That white guy was wrong. He goes to court. He gets what's due him. Now every white person's bad. And every person's a racist. I live in New Mexico. I kept wondering, what about the Hispanics? What about the Latinos? What, 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 we don't care about them. And yet it's 65% of our city and our state. <laughs> See, this is how it works. It divides people, and then this leaves out a whole lot of other people. Folks, this is so demonic. And my Bible tells me this. Here's a scripture for somebody, Galatians 3.28. There is no longer, once you get born again, listen to me, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You can put anything else because they never separated themselves by the color of their skin back then. They separated themselves by who they were. So why can't we say we're believers, we're followers of Christ, regardless of what color we are? Oh, no, because that doesn't work. So as we know, in any classroom, we cannot guarantee outcomes. This is big. You send two kids to school, one gets an A, one doesn't. You can't determine outcomes. What social justice is attempting to do is determine the outcome, whether you earned it or deserve it or not, based on the group you belong to. See, we have equal rights. But we cannot have equal outcomes. It's just not going to happen. Because somebody's going to be faster than somebody else. Someone's going to be smarter than somebody else. Someone's going to be more creative than someone else. Someone's going to have a bigger imagination than someone else. What social justice is attempting to do, and it's an effort in futility because they can't do it, is we want, we want to predict the outcomes. Marxism is built on covetousness. All this economic justice. Listen, anytime you put a name before justice, you no longer have justice. That's why the Bible says God is just. God doesn't have justice. He is justice. Now, when you put economic justice, social justice, racial justice in front of that name, you no longer have justice. You have favoritism. And when God says he's just, he says, I don't favor the rich or the poor, the, the, the small or the big, the fast or the slow. I give you exactly what you're owed, good or bad. But that's not how that works. That's not how it works in our society. And the church, bless its darling hearts, so many. There's some great preachers out there telling, preaching the same stuff. But, man, I'm telling you, there's some churches out there that says we need, if we care, we'll have social justice. They have no idea what they're saying. Social justice is I want something, I deserve something that I didn't earn or deserve. By the way, can I say it this way? God only created one race, and that was called the human race. That's it. And when we come to Christ, we're all one in Christ. We may look a little different. We may be different colors of dirt. And I know people get offended. Well, I'm not dirt. Dude, you're going, you're, you're going back. 
to the dirt. This body is not leaving the earth. Well, we'll get a glorified body. Yeah, it won't be this one. It'll be so glorified, I won't have pain. You know what I found out? When you get start getting older, things are different. <laughs> oh, oh, older men used to tell me stuff when I was younger, and I'd look at them like, you're sick, old man. What's wrong with you? But what they said is true. I mean, I just get up out of a chair, and I'm like, oh, what is going on? What? I got pain. I wake up in the morning, and I have pains. And let me tell you something. When you get older, some of you young guys don't know, but you're going to know what a prostate is. <clears throat> some of you people have been married a while, you go, I know, he talks about it all the time. Some of you 20 year olds are like, what is that? You'll know. Don't even tell him. He'll find out. It'll be alarming. You're 50, 55, buddy, you're in trouble. You, you watch. Oh, man, I can't help myself. <laughs> Woo! What do you say? Preach it. Yeah, I know, brother, I know. I'll, we're going to have prayer lines for prostates one of these days. <laughs> you watch. Everybody over the age of 50 is going to be lined up like, say, I'm, I ain't leaving until I get healed. Come on, brother. Some of you are going to leave here and say, what did the preacher preach? I don't know, man. Well, he was talking about some prostate stuff. And <laughs> I'm trying. See, God cannot be the God of justice and social justice because social justice is not just. Social justice demands extra rights based upon the group to which someone belongs. Justice is getting what you deserve without favor. Social justice is taking from one person to give to another based on something we did not do. Social justice is getting what you don't deserve because you are favored. The Bible teaches us never to favor rich people or poor people in legal proceedings. Social justice wants to give people what they never worked for or earned. It wants to take from someone who has and give it to someone who doesn't have. Not a godly principle, and it's called being covetous, which is the Tenth Commandment, and God said, Thou shalt not covet. Well, what do you mean? Don't they have too much? I deserve some of that. No, you don't. Yeah, but people have too much money. That's not for you to say. And when you start thinking that way, you're, you're lending yourself to covetousness. And, and what does the Bible say? I don't want my neighbor's wife, my neighbor's donkey, my neighbor's manservant, male servant. I don't want anything they have. That's why when I do the Ten Commandments and I teach, we cover our eyes because I'm not looking at anything else. I just want what, God, what, what, you, what you put in my hands. He said, Pastor, that's easy for you to believe. Maybe you have a lot and, and you, you, do, you make a lot. Listen, I believed this my whole life when I had nothing. I never looked at somebody and ever said, you got too much money, man. God, why don't they give that to me? Or go to the government and say, hey, they got, they got millions of dollars. Why don't they give some to me? No one's ever given us anything. My wife will tell you nothing. I mean, gifts here and there, but I'm talking about, no, they've not come and said, you're right. I got so much money, I just want to give you a bunch of it. And can I tell you, it's not healthy for people. Because it keeps them oppressed. But that's what social justice is attempting to do. They're attempting to predict outcomes, and they can't. They can't do it. But that's what this is all about. It wants to take from someone who has and give it to someone who doesn't have. See, God only is just or has justice. And let me say it this way. Justice is blind. Social justice is not. And being a victim is no excuse or reason to hurt someone else. But social justice says it is. So a man goes, robs a store. He gets caught. He goes to trial. 
he gets convicted and guilty, and he goes to jail and gets punished. How many say that's just? Come on. No? I mean, that's, that's fair. That's just. Social justice says a man goes, robs a store, gets arrested, goes to court, and they say, well, wait a minute. Why did he do it? Was he raised in a bad home? Was he abused as a kid? Was he neglected? Was he abandoned? See, that's not just. Because it's not just, especially for the victims of his crime. And God is compassionate, but he's compassionate first to the ones who've been victimized, then to the criminal. See, that's the difference between just and social justice. Social justice says you have no responsibility for your actions. Justice says you will take responsibility for your actions because if it's just, you don't have a choice. Social justice equates rights based on to what group you belong to. They have rights. The homosexual group has more rights than you do. You know, if you go to work tomorrow and say, you know what, I don't think I like those heterosexuals. Do you know what's going to be said to you? Nada. Not a thing. No human resources person is going to come and say, we need to have training. We need to have sensitivity training. Because you're not very sensitive to the heterosexuals. But you go to work tomorrow and you say, I, I don't care for the homosexual community or their movement or their recruiting practices. You could get fired. Terminated. Is that fair? No, because, see, they made up words that we buy into. They made up words like, oh, you're a homophobe. It's like, what? I remember the first time I heard that word, I said, what is that? Oh, you're afraid of me. I'm not afraid. See, they make up stuff and then they pin it on us. Like, I'm afraid of you? I have a fear of you? Like I can catch it? <laughs> well, buddy, just keep your social distance and wear your mask and go get vaccinated or something. <laughs> See, and I know, I know some of you will get ticked off. I know it. Don't send any letters or cards because I'm not going to read them anyway. <laughs> Here's my point. Is it just that you could get fired for that, but you can't get fired for the other? See, that's what social justice does, guys. That's why it's so evil. It's so against the scriptures and the foundation that God says righteousness and justice uphold his throne. It's taking, forcing people to do something they don't want to do or believe something they don't want to believe. That's what social justice does. You have to believe it, and if you don't, then you're such a bad person. Rome, Proverbs 14, 23 says, work, and you will earn a living. And if you sit around talking, you'll be poor. And if I had my mic I could drop, I'd just drop it right there and say, okay. <laughs> it would probably be hanging, though. It wouldn't even drop right. In other words, if you're lazy, you don't get Social justice says, I don't care what you do because maybe you're lazy because you just had a bad home life or your mommy and daddy didn't tuck you in a bed at night. I'm not mocking this, guys. We all have bad stuff in our lives. We're all broken people. But that doesn't give me a reason not to take responsibility. And that's what it's saying. It's taking responsibility away from people and saying you're not responsible. So I know you're lazy, but there's a problem. I know, so we're just going to give you money. We're just going to help you stay lazy. That's not God's way. And then he said, if you don't work, you don't eat. Listen, folks, it's just if you don't eat because you're not working. Social justice says people deserve special treatment. Remember this, God is just. So now people are fighting with those with power and those who don't have it. And I'm not talking about power like because of the governor. I'm talking about the haves and the have-nots. We're fighting. People are just all up in arms. In order for social justice and critical race theory to keep going, you must have conflict. 
There must be fighting. We have to pit this group against that group. And let me say it this way. I don't care where you come from. And I've made fun, but if, you, if, you're, if you're fighting homosexuality, the church is the place that wants to help. If you're, if, you're, if you're fighting laziness, the church can help. If you're fighting addiction, we're here to help heal the brokenhearted. That's what Jesus came for. We have all kinds of people that in this house, even now, that are hurting and broken. You should be here. This is where you need to be. But it's the truth that sets you free, not, not the lies. And getting caught up in stuff. And even so-called Christians are now at odds with the church. Because you're not compassionate. You don't believe. No, I believe people should take responsibility. And if you don't work, you don't eat. That's just simply what the Bible teaches. That's just. Well, I'm hungry. Go to work. Then you can get some money and buy some food. And it doesn't matter if it's real or not as long as it is conflict. What has our political leaders established in the last year and a half? Perpetual conflict. To what end? To control the masses, to usher in evil, and get rid of truth. Isaiah 30, 18, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Social justice is not justice at all. Social justice, again, is getting what you don't deserve because you are favored. And compassion follows justice, and that's what the Bible's teaching. Justice is getting, again, what you, what you don't deserve. Or justice is getting what you do deserve without favor. It doesn't matter what group you belong to because justice truly is blind. Social justice is not. Justice says you commit a crime, you are tried and convicted and punished. That's what justice says. You get what you deserve, go to bed. So if you do good, you get good. You, whatever's due you. Now I want to say this too, that folks, we don't want to pray for God's justice a lot. I don't pray ever for God's justice, really. I always pray for His grace and mercy. Because I don't want what's always do me. So I'm like, God, please forgive me. And people are always like, I want God's justice. Be careful. Because if we all got God's justice, we would all be gone. We wouldn't be here today. But thank God for his grace and mercy that he sent Jesus. I mean, thank God. Thank God he sent him. Social justice doesn't only ask if the person is guilty. It asks about economic conditions. Is he poor or wealthy? What's his upbringing? What type of childhood did he have? What color is he? Is he a member of the group that has been historically oppressed? Social justice demands everyone be equal, period. But remember, you cannot control outcomes. So how can that work? Social justice advocates, advocates have abandoned the word justice, which God is, and declared it unfair. In other words, you take and you have no responsibility for your actions. Justice is all about truth, isn't it? No wonder it's being suppressed all over this country and the world. And being victim, again, is no excuse for hurting other people. We need social justice to even things out, they say, which means favoring the have-nots over the haves. This color over that color. This group of people over that group of people, because we got to try to even it out. In other words, we got to try to fix the outcome. But no matter what they do, they can't do it. It's, it's impossible. Why? Because God is just. It's a game they're playing. So churches aren't preaching the Bible like they should. Some are. Thank God for them. And I've met a lot of great pastors over this last year. And then I've seen the weakest people in pulpits, and I ask myself, my wife's even heard me say this, how can anybody follow that? And I'll tell you why, because they're, they're blinded to the truth too. They don't want to know the truth. The Bible doesn't see the world this way. The poor over the rich, the female over the male. I mean, not too long ago, it was the evil just to be a male. 
Hashtag me too. And it was evil. If you were a male, somehow you were evil. So some women started rising up and said, I have a son. So they're evil too? And now if you're a white male, you're really evil. I'm thinking, really? I'm evil just because of the color of my skin? I didn't make me this way. And just so everybody knows, this book right here is not a white man's religion. Can I say, Jesus was Jewish. Abraham was Jewish. They had multicolors in the Jewish community. <laughs> Somehow Jesus is white? I, I don't understand that. Some say he's black, some say he's Hispanic. The, the Hispanics tell me, you know, Spanish folk tell me all the time, he's going to speak Spanish. <laughs> and you know what? I, be, I, I believe he can. Since he created all languages, I'm sure he knows them all. And it's a, it's a pretty language to listen to. But who knows? Jesus ain't. Jesus didn't come to get a certain color of people. He came to reach all people. I close. Exodus 23, 2. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. That's what's happening with social justice. People, even good-hearted people, so-called Christians, are siding with the crowd. And the crowd will be the majority because narrow is the way to Christ, and very few find that way. Justice is first and foremost about truth. Social justice is not. No one is accountable for their actions under social justice. Justice asks who did it. Social justice asks why they did it. Social justice believes we need to even things out. And this is not justice. When you add a word again to justice, you no longer have justice. Whether it's economic, social, environmental justice then there's no longer justice because they're going to favor a group over another. God says, I don't favor any group over another when it comes to being just. Leviticus 19.15, do not prefer justice. Do not, slow, do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. There can be no justice without righteousness. Amos 5.24, Martin Luther King's famous scripture that he quoted all the time but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Without righteousness, there is no justice. And righteousness is God's way of doing things. Aborting babies is not righteous, so there is no justice in it. And if you don't work and you want a handout, that is, that is, direct, that is in direct opposition to the Word of God. So again, it's not righteous, therefore it cannot be just. And I'm sure you can think of a lot of other examples. It's not just to favor a group over another group just because we're trying to equal things out. It sounds so flowery, doesn't it? That's why the first scriptures I said, flowers fade, but his word lasts for. So I don't know what, I'm gonna, what you're going to believe. I know what I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe the word of God over everything else. And I'm not going to let them suppress it in my family, in my life. We're going to keep believing and honoring the truth because that way, that way, we won't be deceived and blown around, blown about by every teaching. Some of us are on a boat constantly and we don't even realize how seasick we are. We just get tossed and tossed. And it's not because we don't have good hearts. It's because we don't have knowledge. We don't know. Now you know. So the next time someone says something to you, you have ammo. You can say, oh, that's not right, and here's why. Because they hold nobody accountable. So no one's responsible for their actions. Folks, I know a lot of abused people, hurt people, people that have been decimated as kids. They've grown up and not hurt one human being. It's no excuse because I got hurt or I didn't have this or my childhood was this way to hurt other people. One of the things I love about Legacy is we got everybody that comes here. We got the tall, the big, the small, 
short. And that's the way I've always wanted to have a church. I said to our staff a long time ago, we're just going to let anybody come and serve that wants to serve, that believes in God. We're not going to be like the big, you know, the mega churches that have a certain look. I can't stand the look. Because they, they pick people based on how they look and how they dress. And I'm like, why don't we just pick people based on do they love God? And are they talented? Because, because when these mega churches do this, and I know some of them watch, you're not just. Because you say, I want to put off a certain look. Really? What, what look is that? I thought it was supposed to be just human looks. And all of us have different looks. I know my wife looks at me with different looks. Sometimes I'm like, oh, man, that's not a good look. <laughs> She's looking at me like that right now. I didn't want to look down. But aren't we people made in the image of Christ? I think, it's, I think our church is so, I really do like our church. I like being a part of it. I like the feel of it. I like the spirit. Do you know what liberates us all is truth. So hopefully I did an okay job, and I mean this. At least you understand what we're fighting against when you hear these terms keep coming down the pike, and they make them sound so righteous, and they're anything but righteous. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being here. I thank you for teaching us. Thank you for helping us all. I thank you, Father, for changing our lives, that we can at least be grateful that Jesus is the owner. And Jesus came and died for me, for us, to save us. So, Father, I thank you for salvation. Without salvation, we are all lost. All of us are lost. Thank you for saving us. If that's all you do, God, that's enough. That's enough. That's enough. So we just humble ourselves before you, tell you how grateful we are. Thank you, God, for healing the brokenness in people. I know there's hurting people in here. I know there's people that needed to hear that you're just, that you'll help them and you won't favor this person over that person. If we do your word, you just perform it. doesn't matter who we are as long as we're believers. God, thank you for being so just. Thank you for being so righteous and thank you for being so compassionate. Thank you for being here with us today. In Jesus' name. If you're here with every head bowed online or in here and you say, Pastor, would you pray with me? I walked with God, but I walked away. I need to get my life right. Or you say, Pastor, would you pray with me? I've never really given God my, any, my heart ever. I believed in him. I knew he was real, but I've never invited him to come live in my heart. And you do that by believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only way, the truth, and the life. Nobody, nobody goes to the Father except through him. You cannot have a relationship with God without Jesus. No matter how good you think you are, you can't. That's why the Holy Spirit's working in hearts and minds that the people I can see and the people I can't. And he's working in hearts and minds to say, come on, let's get it right. Invite me into your life and watch what I can do. If that's you in Jesus' name, right where you see it all over this place. And if you're online, just a moment of, just a moment of stillness. And online, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing I'm going to ask everybody in here to do. If you're in here and you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Right where you're seated. And folks, this is very meaningful. And I think it's so important for you for your future with God, for your walk with God, to be able to say, I don't care what anybody else thinks, I just want Jesus in my life. If that's you in Jesus' name, right where you're seated all over this place, are you ready? I'm going to ask you to do something without any hesitation. Just say yes to God. Who cares who knows what? As long as God knows, I just want to get it right. I want, to, I want you to live inside me. I need you in my life. If that's you in Jesus' name, right where you're seated all over this place and online, in Jesus' name, are you ready? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you're ready, all I'm going to ask you to do is just, would you lift your hand up right now where you're seated. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. I'm going to look across the church. Who else? God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you over here. God bless you, sir, right here. 
Who else as I look across the church? God bless you. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. Thank you. I'm going to look across the top one more time. Anybody else? By the lifting of your hand. Thank you. Thank you, young lady right here. God bless you. I'm going to look across the top. Anybody else? Thank you, sir. God bless you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. God loves people. God bless you over here. Thank you so much. Ma'am, God bless you. God loves you. God does care. But you've got to let him care. By coming to him. And we all come to him the same way. We just humble ourselves and says, you know, God, this is the way i got to do it. This is where I'm going to do it. I just want you in my life. Anybody else before we close? Say, I want to join these. We're all going to pray together. But I want you to acknowledge that. I want you to be able to say, I want God. And Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. Anybody else before we close? Father, thank you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, I thank you for everyone who lifted their hands tonight. The ones we see and the ones we can't see. I pray you bless them. I pray you be with them. I pray, God, with all my heart that they would truly come to know you and know your ways. They'd serve you and recognize how great and good you are. How much you love that you sent your son to die for, for them. So bless each one, Father, in Jesus' name. If you lifted your hand, I want you to pray this prayer aloud with me right where you're seated. I want everybody in here to pray with us. If you're right with God, pray in support of those because you don't know who lifted their hand up. It could be right next to you. But we just want to support them and say, you know what? We, we, we did that. We're going to do it with you. And, and for you that lifted your hand, I'm just going to introduce you to Jesus. He's the only Savior. Would you pray this prayer with me aloud? Would you pray, Father, I choose to believe in Jesus. And I believe He is your Son. And I believe He is Lord of all. Now I believe that with my heart today. And now with my mouth, I willingly confess. I give you permission to my life. Jesus, be Lord of my life. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. I believe in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord, church.